Every era has its new diseases. AIDS is not the first and won't be the last. Our history and destiny are shaped by our diseases. The origins of our ills are complex, mysterious and surprising. And they must be understood if we are to avoid always being plagued. very powerful association within Western culture of disease, sexuality, and danger. We know that their product kills tens of thousands of our citizens each year. The agent of this disease was a very powerful industry. I had no idea that one in seven people will have a stroke during their lifetime. That's what hit you. Never before in history have we had such powerful weapons against disease, and we've come to depend on them. But this dependence has its risks, because we tend to think the causes and cures of our ills are simple. There are babies on this ward with diseases which tell parallel and tragic stories. Some of the babies have a terrifying new disease, Others an illness which burst upon Europe 500 years ago. It all began in the southern Italian city of Naples, where the people have always been known for their great love of life. At the end of the 15th century, Emperor Charles of France invaded Italy. After conquering Rome, his army moved south to the city of Naples. They met little resistance from the Neapolitans, who let the foreigners inside their walls. But the friendly Neapolitans took in more than they ever imagined. They welcomed the army with its retinue of camp followers into their homes and into their beds and found themselves with a disease which would change the course of history. It was a terrible disease, which no one had seen before. Their bones would ache and crack. They would get fevers and they would get temperatures. They'd feel very tired, they'd develop a rash all over them. And the body swelled, it developed buboes, these open sores, the body began literally to rot away. The disease which appeared in the 15th century was syphilis, and it arrived much like the new disease of the 1980s. First you'd see one person, and then, all the, then you'd see the, the signs in two or three people, and then you'd see more and more who had sort of gotten on that conveyor belt uh, toward death. We had nothing in the context of our experience in terms of something as horrible and as brutal as what AIDS has become. This new disease in the 1980s, AIDS, arrived uncannily like syphilis had in the 16th century. But it was so long ago, we'd forgotten the lessons. At the end of the 15th century, syphilis hit Europe. There's a similarity here to how AIDS has come in the last 15 years to the Western world. This disease was seen for the first time. It occurred in predominantly young people. It occurred in people who were living in urban communities, in towns, in other words. They hadn't got any resistance to the disease. They were racked with other diseases, like tuberculosis, like scurvy, like near starvation. Now, people got ill much more severely than people get ill nowadays with early syphilis. People actually died of it at a fairly early stage. It starts off with a, an ulcer on the genitals, which we call a shanker. This ulcer's painless, it doesn't hurt. So it can crop up without people realizing it. It would have occurred on a man's penis or a woman's vagina, or sometimes around the anus or around the lips. 
And then you'd see these purple lesions start to creep over people's faces. They'd stop. They'd start as a little spot, and perhaps they'd grow on their cheeks, or they'd grow on their nose, and so people would look like some horrific image of Bozo the Clown with a great big purple nose. Nobody could conceive of this thing. You know, we are not from an era that has things like plagues. This was just 10, 15 years ago with AIDS. Imagine what it was like when whole communities of people were going down with this new disease at the end of the 16th century. As with AIDS today, when syphilis first appeared, there was no cure. But they did use the very unpleasant treatment, mercury. But mercury at best is not very good treatment for syphilis. It works to a slight extent, but causes terrible side effects. It made your breath foul. It stopped your kidneys working properly. It made your teeth fall out. And it caused a very peculiar psychotic behavior. And it's always thought that the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland had mercury poisoning because hatters had to use mercury to rub in the rabbit skins when they were preparing hats. I think people who were alive in the 15th century dealing with syphilis had a much easier time uh, comprehending, conceiving of what an epidemic was. You've got to remember, for most of my generation, uh, my distinct memory as a child was when we all stood up in our grade school gymnasiums one Sunday afternoon and we got our vaccines. And from that moment on, there was going to be nothing new under the sun in terms of diseases. Well, I got out of journalism school in 1975, and one of my first stories was to write about the big health problem in the gay community, which at that time was gonorrhea and syphilis. Okay, today, right here, right now, you thought it was safe to walk the streets of San Francisco. No. Gay men in San Francisco accepted that technology could solve anything, and there was nothing we really had to worry about was such a simple thing. You got syphilis, you got gonorrhea, you bent over and you got your shot, and that was that. It's ironic that an epidemic of that old disease, syphilis, raged in those years before AIDS appeared. If only the medical authorities had tried harder to teach safe sex during the syphilis epidemic, instead of relying on penicillin, then the fertile ground for AIDS might not have existed. It seemed that, you know, year after year, every disease uh, was getting more and more serious, and the numbers were just astronomical. And we could turn around today and say, my God, you know, if only we had done something then. But little was done then. And in a very short time, AIDS had spread across the globe. Not too different, in fact, from syphilis 500 years before, which also arrived because of international travel. It's thought that Columbus may have brought back syphilis from the New World. And there are suggestions that some of Columbus's sailors then fought with the French in Naples, taking their infection with them. And as it spread throughout Europe, each national group not only saw it coming from another national group, but from a national group that they could see as being dangerous. The Neapolitans, of course, saw this as the French disease, and the French immediately saw it as a Neapolitan disease. And therefore, of course, it's never our sexuality that's at fault. It's always their sexuality that's at fault. It's never the straight or the gay. It's never the German or the French. It's always somebody else. And that's where danger lies. It lies across the border from who we think we are. This is the 10 Eyewitness News. The public school system will teach and train our children into deviant, unnatural homosexual activity. I used to breed bulls, and until they got something better to do, they'd engage, they'd be homosexual, you know? You just had this outbreak of hysteria. It had everything to do with our social attitudes toward the people who got AIDS. 
It was a disease that was not only scary in its own right, but it was scarier because it was attached to these people who were foreign, who were alien, who were, who were so different than we are. And that, that magnified the terror for people. Undertaker's assistants are nervous about bodies infected with the AIDS virus. Two assistants had unwittingly handled the body of an AIDS victim at the Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital. Bans were immediately placed and all AIDS victims who die in hospitals will be placed in sealed polythene bags and Undertaker's assistants are to wear full protective clothing. Now, the people who did have a wonderful, you know, philosophy into which AIDS fit, fit perfectly were the fundamentalist Christians. And, of course, they basically, you know, have a medieval philosophy in which there is an avenging God that can smite down people who violate his laws with horrible plagues. And so when AIDS came along, AIDS fit in wonderfully from their point of view because they didn't like gays to start with, they didn't like sex to start with. So here was God coming and doing what he did in the days of Joshua in terms of killing his enemies. King's Cross has become a center of vice. A good time. With perverts Fabulous. and other people. A Fabulous. wild time. Oh, without, mentioning, without mentioning Great names. Fred. And on that day, That's we're going to have good. a center of virtue That's instead of being a center of vice. Both the Catholic Church and the new reformers in the North, Martin Luther and the other German Protestant reformers, saw this new disease, syphilis, as proof that the world was going to hell in a handbasket, that people were no longer in control of their bodies, of their sexualities. People were being punished for being lascivious. People were being punished for being sexually active. And how did we know they were being punished? Well, they were dying on the streets. Pretty good indication that the punishment was real, that it was there, and that God knew what was going on in the bedchamber. The prejudice against those with sexually transmissible diseases lasted right up to the 20th century. I beg your pardon. Yes, doctor. Did you say yes? Yes, Rashbire. He said syphilis. Oh, I declare. The cause of man's most vicious disease before our eyes. Hardly more than a motion. And that motion is a dance of death. If the germ has been discovered, it's cause to hope for a cure. Syphilis became the first disease ever to have a magic bullet, a treatment targeted at a germ. With his 606th attempt, Dr. Paul Ehrlich found a cure. 606, the magic number by which devils may be cast out of the bodies of men. But in the 40s, the best magic bullet in history came along. We had no really effective weapon with which to combat these massive human afflictions until science gave us this. Penicillin. But although penicillin was a marvelous magic bullet, it did have one serious side effect. It gave us false confidence in medical fixes. You see, all the medicine money can buy isn't necessarily the answer. It's certainly not stopping the disastrous spread of epidemics in one of the richest nations in the world. Particularly in the United States, AIDS in the 90s is no longer a gay disease. It is a gay, black, and Hispanic disease. And it's still those other, other people, those strange people, those people who do not engender the kind of political response you need in order to get the job done of stopping the epidemic. And Hispanic New York is a dangerous place. Not just because of muggings and robbery, but because of the risk of catching HIV or syphilis. 
the reasons for these frightening epidemics have more to do with the forces which fracture a society than any germs. Poor people have always been the uh, focus of epidemics in history. There's an epidemic of syphilis in the United States now uh, associated with a number of things. Uh, the abysmal living conditions of a lot of people, the absence of access to health care, um, and the HIV epidemic. They interact together. These are the areas with some of the highest rates of syphilis in the country. Probably upwards of 50% of the men have a drug use history, 25% of the women. A very common thing is crack for sex exchange, so that women who are uh, involved in using this drug are essentially selling themselves on the street. Hundreds of partners a year. And since there's such a high rate of syphilis in the male population, usually untreated, uh, the likelihood of transmission or infection with women is very high. Every family has a few members who have uh, use drugs, every family has a few members who have AIDS. This is one of our hospitals from our medical school called Bronx Lebanon Hospital. It is really a MASH unit. In this hospital's uh, emergency room, 38% of the adult patients test HIV positive. That's just people coming in off the street. So huge numbers of people in New York are carrying and spreading HIV without knowing it. And some of them even have syphilis as well. So the old and the new diseases feed off each other. You get this kind of interaction between uh, two epidemics, uh, HIV and syphilis. So in the last year or two, we've seen 100% increases in syphilis. But more alarmingly, an increase in congenital syphilis, which is syphilis transmitted to the unborn infant. Yeah. All right, I just wanted to talk to you. I know we've spoken before about this, but I just want to review it with you. Okay. So far, we have held off giving you any more treatment because your blood has been going down really well from the syphilis from before. Shh. Okay, You're sweetie. Be quiet. But you have another test to do because yeah. when you have that one, it's going to have been a year since your last oh, okay. shot. And what normally happens is within a year, this should now be negative in your blood. Now, if it's not negative in your blood, excuse me one second. Okay. If it's not negative in your blood, then there's a small possibility that somewhere along the line, and it might have even been a while ago, you did get reinfected. And since we want to make sure nothing happens in this pregnancy like happened the last time, we might need to treat you again if this next one isn't really negative. The other issue is that in the last time there had been some cocaine and some yeah. marijuana. Now, the two things we're working on here is getting your syphilis totally out of your system, and we're going to check you again and treat you again if we need to, and getting drugs totally out of your system. Okay. Is it the same partner now? Yes. He's been tested to be negative. Okay. We are seeing a large number of stillbirths due to syphilis, and obviously that is the worst outcome that you could find, especially in light of it being a completely treatable disease. And that's due to no prenatal care. It is so easy to pick it up. If the women ever came, it's very easy to treat, but we are missing these people. They do not show up until they're having labor and a baby may already be dead. The block is mostly known for drug sellers. So like Harlem, regular Harlem. Drugs, fighting, guns, crack. Okay, marijuana. Hold it with two hands. Don't drop it. He not gonna share. You get yours. He can hit home. The first miscarriage, the baby was um, born dead at six months. The second one stayed alive for half an hour and died. But I don't know if the second one's from the syphilis or the drug use. It's like everywhere. If I look out my window, you see somebody out there selling. I see somebody out there buying. You know, like the only thing you might not see is I'm out there using it on the street. Except for like marijuana, they smoke it anywhere. I don't really like to look out the window anyway. I don't want my daughter no public assistance when she gets big. I want her to have a good job, you know, go to school. And for all my kids, I think they'll turn out pretty good, you know. They'll do me proud in the long run. So there's a third epidemic, and this one's an epidemic of illegal drugs. From it flows AIDS and syphilis, and it's a needless waste. 
Well, the drug problem here is, uh, has, you know, it obsesses uh, the country at this point. It's used as the uh, explanation for everything wrong with America. It's attributable to drugs, not to mismanagement, not to greed, not to bad planning, not to an absence of political will to do uh, many of the social projects that clearly need doing. In New York City alone, which has a budget of $27 billion a year, we're spending upwards of $5 billion on criminal justice system proceedings for drug users. Not for criminals who put a gun to your head, they should be prosecuted and put away, but for people who buy and sell and use drugs. Whether you uh, decide to view this as a disease, for example, and offer treatment, or view it as a moral failing and decide to declare war on it. You know, we have a war mentality prevalent in this country at this time. apparatus that's been created around the drug wars. Police, prosecutors, courts, detention facilities, prisons. Policy decisions about the deciding to spend money on prisons rather than drug treatment are made at the highest level. They're made by the mayor and the city and the governor of the state and the president of the United States. I believe that uh, you will not eliminate uh, drugs unless you deal with the suppliers and the users. And the suppliers you interdict the drugs before they come here to the best of your ability uh, with the military. Uh, the drugs will come in nevertheless. And then you have to be very tough on the uh, consumers. We've uh, doubled the prison population in New York City in the last 10 years, almost exclusively associated with drugs. Our money, stop taking pictures of me, hey. man! Let's go. I've convinced now that our drug policies do far more harm than good. I spent about five and a half years as a criminal prosecutor in the Bronx and then in a citywide prosecution agency. And in that time, I sent to jail probably two to three, perhaps 4,000 people for drug offenses. I support the legislation that requires major uh, prison terms locally, federally, and where appropriate, uh, I'm also for the death penalty. The drug laws pretend to address what is really a public health problem and not a criminal law problem. Uh, sending people to jail for possessing drugs or using drugs is, in a sense, blaming the victim, and in another sense, an intrusion into behavior that is really none of the government's business. I'd stuff them into jail, just as the Japanese uh, did. They broke the drug problem uh, in uh, Japan. They used amphetamines. You go look at a Japanese prison. It's not like an American prison, or probably not like... It's more like a Japanese uh, prisoner of war camp. <laughs> I mean, our crimes are overwhelmingly caused by people who are on drugs. I believe it's appropriate to punish people. They're punishing us. I have a friend and client named Corinne, uh, who's a young woman uh, who works on the streets uh, as a prostitute. She is an opiate injector. She injects heroin several times a day. And because of the way that heroin has been made unavailable through the drug laws, she has to have sex with strangers for money in order to feed her drug habit. Sometimes the narcotic squad police We'll just be driving down the street. They pull up and they tell you to put your hands against the wall and they tell you to empty your pockets. I don't carry around my needles or my pipe, my crack stems, because I've been arrested for that. I didn't have any drugs on me, just the, the needle. We never get the big fish. We inhale these people like a whale inhales plankton. And it makes no dent on the drug trade except to make it more violent, uh, more nasty, and create more suffering. Well, I did have a place to live up until a couple of weeks ago, so I'm living on the street, basically. I slept all day in the park across the street. Anybody bother you while you were there? No, but just the fact, you know, what people must think of me, look at me and think I'm sleeping in the park. I tried to make it look like I just sat there 
laid um, down and take the sun tan. About half of the 200,000 drug injectors in New York are infected with the AIDS virus, and yet the city has steadfastly refused to open a needle exchange program or to offer clean needles and how to use them to drug users, arguing that it gives the wrong message. In fact, in New York City, people who give out needles in the street are prosecuted. Which hasn't stopped groups like this, who ignore the laws to help drug users avoid HIV infection. This is health care in the United States, especially New York. It's do-it-yourself health care. We have all these dirty needles. We have probably, like, I don't know, 15,000 by now. We're making bleach kits tonight, which is something we do every Friday night uh, in preparation for going out on the street on Saturday mornings. I'm doing it because I, like a lot of people in this city, have lost a lot of friends and, and family to AIDS. My father died of AIDS in 1985. We risk arrest when we do this, yes. Yeah, and there's a cop right there. So we better be careful. You can um, exchange dirty works for clean ones. Oh, so good. don't share the cotton, the cooker, the water, nothing. Because the virus can live in the... Okay. Be safe. Final search. It's kind of like, no, you're getting something clean out here. It's almost like a guarantee. This kind of like gives me peace of mind. I mean, every time you look at this block, somebody's missing. Right. You know what I mean? They're, they're laying yeah. in the casket like somewhere. Huh? This is very frightening. And I think we all have optimism that ultimately we won't, this won't be illegal, that this will be recognized as a public health measure that has to be taken in this emergency situation. But despite the emergency situation, there's still very little being done with tragic results. In the 1990s, this tale of two diseases comes together in nurseries across New York. Babies with the Neapolitan disease syphilis and others with HIV. These are homeless children, mostly of intravenous drug users. They're infected with HIV and nearly all of them will die because of it. The tragedy is that many of them needn't have been infected at all. If only the United States authorities had had the guts or will to use the lessons learned in other places, such as Merseyside in the depressed northwest corner of England. Here, help for IV drug users is legal, from prescribing heroin to providing clean needles and syringes. And sometimes we can give out, uh, we can collect 2,000 syringes a week. Uh, that's if it's sort of quiet. And then sometimes if we catch a lot of users on a certain day, then we can give out 2,000 syringes in a day. We've got various boxes. These sizes here will be used probably and collected once every 10 days. And this is, belongs just to one user. You know, so that's somebody with a big habit. And obviously there'll be a few people that'll come into that. We've got to cater for the client's needs. one of the biggest houses in the States or council houses in the States in Europe. And this is the biggest drug sort of dealing area around our city. We've got about 22,000 families on here. And we've got clients in nearly every street. And there's a lot of people struggling here at the moment. We'd be looking at probably 20,000 drug users in general. But drug injectors, we may be looking at about 10,000 drug injectors. We've got a prescribing regime in this region that is really considered quite radical. It's Tom and John. And what's radical about this system is that instead of punishing drug users, they try to keep them as healthy as possible until they give up their habit. The needle exchange actually goes out to the users, and the doctor is licensed to prescribe a wide range of otherwise illegal drugs. If the state is to control any commodity, whether it's drugs or bananas, it must actually have a legal supply. Legally prescribed drugs in this fashion, um, which has been going on, I hate to add, since the 20s, uh, has resulted in this locality with no HIV infection. And this is an area with a seaport that still trades with Africa and South America, a lot of prostitution, a lot of drug takers, 
So if anybody should have been hit with HIV infection, it should have been this area. In addition to that, there's been locally a 15-fold reduction in crime, and perhaps most remarkable, a 12-fold reduction of incidence in new drug-taking cases. We've got the services established now where people can get clean equipment, where they can get advice, where they can get monitored on a regular basis, and it is a user-friendly oh, nice system. Yeah, nice one. What do you need? The programme that I'm on now, I get a prescription of methadone and heroin. I get that three times a week. Uh, it's just been a, a, a gradual process of change since I was first um, given prescribed drugs anyway. You know, I mean, I haven't been involved in any criminal activities at all. You know, I haven't used any street gear. In fact, when I do these days, it makes me extremely ill. I mean, my life's improved anyway. My life is markedly improved, I would say, in quality anyway. I might, may very likely go to college in September. A prescription is issued strictly contingent upon them attending regularly for counselling. Uh, so I think we make drug taking boring because they just go to the chemist and pick up their supply. And we make it mildly irritating and continually confront them with their lives by them having to come weekly for uh, group psychotherapy and counselling and us presenting to them the vacuous nature of what they're doing if it goes on indefinitely. I think we bore them off drugs if we get them off at all. We just make it very boring. What are you injecting? In my groin. <clears throat> you know that's very dangerous. You could end up losing a leg. Well, that's the only place I can inject. Have you ever thought about packing all this in? Yeah, I have thought about it, like... I'm just... It's getting round to it, like, I haven't... I do want to pack drugs in. It's just when. It's not now, like... There's no time like the present. I know, but I keep saying I'll do it and I'll do it and it just gets put off. And, like, I find that... I haven't got round to do it all the time. It's not right to do it, isn't it? The, the time's never right, like... Perhaps you should make it right. I don't know. I've been into them for a while now, and it's just... It's not easy, like, is it getting off? Well, I can bring you into the hospital today and get your... I don't want to stop using it. I like it. I like the effect. And what are you wanting from us? Well, I want to swap one smack on for one methadone on. If you hang on outside and the jury here will discuss that. They give up at the rate of about 5% per year. This is roughly the rate, regardless of what you do. Whether you put them in prison or stick them in mental hospitals and give them electric shocks, we've done all these things. However, it's certainly the cheapest method. Giving a supply of drugs to those who will use regardless renders unnecessary the pyramid selling activity that they have to sell onto others to finance their own habit. So I'm concerned is we want to stop you using the street drugs, because that's going to make you grind and right mess. So, you know, we'll give you the pure stuff and just see how it goes. OK, then. We'll give it a try. I'll give it a go. What we hope to achieve with the needle exchange and prescribing initiatives is basically not what happened in Edinburgh, where they stopped prescribing and stopped offering clean needles. And everybody started sharing needles and uh, injecting rubbish drugs, and they got an HIV epidemic. See how he's uh, lumps and bumps out, really. Oh. Everything well? Yeah, good, good. Fully relaxed after our weekends, and that's it, really. No, I mean, just relax with your kids and that. How's your boxes? Uh, full, very full. So have you got any problems with your injecting sites or anything like that? Only on the arms at the moment because, I mean, it's such a small vein that I've got there. Yeah. See, I'm having to go, not in, I'm having to go sideways yeah. and up and along. The flesh seems to bruise and swell above the vein, so instead of going in at a 45-degree angle and straightening up as normal, I'm going to just bang like that and then straighten up. So what have you been using lately then, Shush, anything? 
Bit of skag. Yeah. Lovely speed on Thursday, Thursday evening. Kept me going till Saturday. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's where we went out for a day, Saturday. If uh, prohibition returned in England in the way it is in America, then I think HIV would spread as it is doing in America. In one city, New York alone, there are a quarter of a million people infected with the AIDS virus. It's really a public health hazard to the rest of the world in that New Yorkers travel and that EEC parliamentarians were there last year wanting to quarantine the city. But even with such strong evidence against drug wars, the United States persists with its unhealthy policies. We don't know how to make it go away. We have no magic bullet. What we need to do is to find a way to bring those people into contact with a system that can care for them. If that involves giving them drugs under controlled conditions, as has been done elsewhere in the world, that's what we should do. There are people who believe that drugs should be legalized. I'm absolutely against that. It's ridiculous. It is a licentiousness and an acceptance uh, of a lifestyle that uh, we have to um, address uh, here. I don't really think about it too much, but I don't have much of a future doing what I'm doing unless I stop doing what I'm doing. <laughs> But I know a lot of people that have AIDS. And I also knew, you know, quite a few people that died from it. I mean, I'm in the highest risk there is possible. Prostitutes, IV drug users, and on both. <laughs> Soon after this film was shot, we had a letter from Corinne's lawyer and friend, John Sirocco. He believed she was dead. She was, said Sirocco, someone marginalized by her own society, which had made her a person without value, a society whose laws and policies had slowly put her and others like her to death. So the real causes of most epidemics aren't germs or heroin. They're the social forces which shape our lives forces so powerful they can stop us using the medical knowledge we already have. The tobacco epidemic is an example of this, and it shows why we don't tackle many health problems head on. Heart attacks and strokes are smoking-related diseases, and in the United States alone, one person dies of them every 34 seconds, and they're dying from preventable diseases. Cigarettes are the single most profitable consumer product ever developed. From the mouth of, the, of a board member of one of the leading tobacco companies comes this wonderful appraisal of just how profitable cigarettes are. He said, he's quoted as saying, tell you what I like about the cigarette business. Costs a penny to make, sell it for a dollar, it's addictive. The tobacco companies don't care that their products cause disease. They don't care that their products kill people. The only thing that they care about and the only thing that they're honest about is making profit from what they do. We once calculated that the tobacco industry as a whole in the United States is spending between 400 and $600 million a year just to pay for lawyers. And they can afford to do it. They can afford to buy up the legal establishment just to take uh, no chances on any lawyer joining the other side, the health forces, and actually raising significant health legal issues about smoking. They've bought a conspiracy of silence. So the power of profit is an enormous barrier. And the tobacco manufacturers are all too aware that if you're not smoking by the age of 19, you're unlikely ever to smoke. The tobacco industry's efforts today are doubled and redoubled in terms of trying to attract new customers, and the only place that they can get them is from the ranks of our children. Think about the 
absurdity of the tobacco of the Philip Morris brand executive coming into an office of the ad agency and saying, look, I want you to design a campaign which will make this cigarette incredibly exciting and attractive and alluring to the 19-year-old who's decided to smoke and is smoking in camels. And, will, and, and so exciting that he'll change brands. But whatever you do, don't make it attractive. Don't make smoking attractive to the 18-year-old who hasn't quite decided whether he or she is going to smoke or not. I mean, it's absurdity. The fact of the matter is they use the most powerful imagery and themes available to make that cigarette attractive, to make smoking attractive. And of course it's going to affect young people. But the merchants of death, the tobacco profiteers, haven't got away with this by themselves. Governments and the media have actually helped them. There was an advertisement called Pretty Face, which was drawing to the public's attention that smoking just doesn't age you internally. It also helps create wrinkles. This advertisement was clearly targeted at 14 to 16 year old girls. And after it had been shown on television a couple of times, the tobacco industry responded by making a complaint, alleging that this advertisement was false and misleading. And the ad was pulled off the air. With breathtaking double standards, the same committee allowed this ad through. It showed bath salts taking wrinkles away. It's interesting how the truth can change depending on the power of the lobby. We deal with them with kid gloves and we whip them with feathers when we really should be stamping them out far more vigorously. No politician has the power to stand up to the tobacco industry and its economic and political force. The only way that politicians will stand up is if there's an equal force on the other side and that force has to be the force of organised citizens demanding action. And in Australia, that action came from concern about other people's smoke. The federal court in Sydney has ruled that passive smoking is a serious health risk. The consumer and health movements have hailed the decision as a world first. Justice Morling the... found there was scientific proof that exposure to cigarette smoke by non-smokers causes lung cancer, this asthma... This has been a and David and Goliath disease. battle between the consumer movement and the tobacco industry. Tobacco companies rely on billboards and sporting sponsorships, but they'll be heavily restricted now in the claims they can make about cigarettes. Although doctors have been warning about cigarettes for 40 years, it took the threat of litigation for Australian employers to ban smoking in the workplace. It took the threat to their profits to make health a priority and get the tobacco industry on the run. But they found a place to go, to developing nations where the cigarette manufacturers have arrived in force and are already earning vast profits. There are millions of children in the developing world today who die prematurely of entirely preventable smoking diseases. And this is one of the most devastating diseases they're likely to face, stroke, where a blood clot in the brain can cripple you for life. Uh, no, no. Mm? Mine. Oh, mine. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> now tell everybody what you did. Uh, I don't know, okay? Sorry. Now raise both arms straight out in front at shoulder level. In Western countries, stroke is the third commonest cause of death. But at least as tragic are the people maimed by their stroke, like Derek, a former smoker whose disability, although hidden, is still devastating. I was a commercial advertising manager. I sponsored a new TV commercial. I sponsored um, a... I was about to go there the day that they balanced a crew, um, we had a crew, well, oh, sorry, in Canada, in Canberra, and we had a six months, um, so it was all sorts of things. Uh, I, I, I haven't made much sense, but I did. Go and collect the object 
that was given to the lady and give it to the person next to Bob. Okay. Now, now tell us what you did. Before I had a stroke, I didn't expect one. That's simple. Wednesdays and Thursdays are the busy days. Mondays, Mondays, Tuesdays and Fridays are... Uh, uh, I sit and think and, and think about it. That's all. Mm. Some of these children are facing Derek's fate. Around one in seven will have a stroke, partly through smoking, but largely because their blood pressure will be too high. And high blood pressure is another preventable health problem if we take the right sort of action. Why don't we need a lot of salt in our scones? Because it will taste horrible. It will be too salty. And this action is surprisingly simple. If these children were to consume half a teaspoonful less of salt each day, one child in this class would be saved from a stroke. But to do this, the habit of a lifetime, the habit begun in childhood must be broken. And that habit is the taste for salt. But like smoking, the battle against the taste for salt is also a fight against the hard sell. And salt is only part of the story. There's a tremendous amount of food advertising directed specifically at children. And it usually is focusing on uh, fast foods, um, convenience foods, uh, popular brands of um, high fat, high sugar, low fibre foods. The most advertised foods are the ones which we would recommend the least and increasingly very sophisticated methods are being employed by the food industry. And I think that is a very, very difficult pressure to counter. It's not just salt that's important in these diseases. It's the amount of fat in the diet, the amount of fibre, whether or not people overeat. And it's even the way we produce our food. Today, we're still using old farming techniques which yield high-fat milk. It has been proved that the milk from Australian cattle is rich in butterfat content, and after the buttermilk has been drawn off, salt is added to bring up the flavour of the butter. So the battle against avoidable tragedies like stroke is just as complex as the war against drugs. If the milk being produced is still as high-fat as it ever was, and the beef and lamb being produced is still as high-fat carcasses as they ever were, then even if the products, the end products, are low-fat, the, the excess fat, which is not being put in those products, which is not visible in those products, will enter the food supply somewhere else. And what's often happening now is with the very successful campaigns and programs to encourage people to have low-fat dairy products, there then is a butter mountain that has to be got rid of. And this fat is dumped into cheap processed foods which are bought by the poor. Just as it was wrong to focus on the germ in syphilis and AIDS, so the causes of heart disease and strokes are far more than sugar, salt or fat. What's this, Tony? There's no, not the red, all right? It, uh, it, it. Yep, that's right. You're writing a letter. Good, letter. and the letter goes in the. It works. Why? Someone help Tony yeah. out, will you? Bob? Envelope. Uh, Envelope. I don't, I don't know. One. Lad? In, in now, 15. Don't know. Don't you? No. The sad message in the envelope is that this tragedy was preventable if only we'd used the available knowledge. We know how to prevent the commonest causes of death and the magic bullets of medicine only help a little. There are a few things I want to talk over. The magic bullet will cure thousands. But 
There can be no final victory over diseases of the body unless the diseases of the soul are also overcome. They feed upon each other. In days to come, there will be epidemics of greed, hate, ignorance. Whatever epidemics we face, we'll never be free of threats to our well-being. The way of conquering these threats is to realize where they come from and do something about them. And it's only then that we might avoid our future being plagued 